Hello, everybody, and welcome to this fireside chat that we have added to our calendar on today, uh, September 5th. We thought it was very important since we've had some amazing announcements come out about the Jamboree in November to have a fireside chat just dedicated to information around the jam. So welcome. I am Catherine Preventure, the Director of Patient Advocacy for the IGG Forward Foundation, and I am joined with by doc, with Dr. Stone, the Executive Chairman of the Foundation. Thank you. Wonderful to be here today. So before we begin, we're just going to go over an announcement we have. Uh, our next exciting caregiver conversation is October 18th of 2024, and that's going to be with me. Um, and also some wonderful patients from um, the community that are going to be joining and having a very important conversation in regard to mental health and how it impacts um, them living with IgG4 related disease. So stay tuned for more information regarding that. Next slide, thank you. And before we hop into all the exciting information regarding the jam, we thought it was important to show some barriers to care survey results. So last month I did a uh, article regarding the barriers to care and navigating some of those barriers within the community. And I had some wonderful insights uh, from the Alliance for Patient Access as well as the results from this survey. And they were just so eye-opening and interesting that we thought we would share them now. Next slide, please. So one of the questions was if individuals had to change their treatment that was prescribed by their physician for IgG4 related disease because of insurance or due to the high cost or the insurance would not cover it. And you know the, the statistic speaks for itself, 90% have had to do that. And this is you know eye-opening and shows the barrier that people face when trying to first they get their diagnosis and then they have to you know get the right treatment and and they're you know forced to change that and these this is the reality under which we live at the moment and uh, things like this really add to burden of illness uh, for patients and I can tell you as a clinician they add to uh, burden uh, of medicine as well. 90% have had to change medications because of insurance coverage limitations. So the foundation is working with groups like the uh, Access for pa uh, Alliance for Patient Access uh, to try to improve this. And then 71% of these individuals that have had to change their uh, treatment have had a, a negative health effect because of that. So that just shows and emphasizes how critical is it is for patients to stay on the right medication that their doctor is pres prescribing. Because as you know, Dr. Stone, disrupts, disruptions in the treatment impact, you know, the longevity of taking care, the care and worsening symptoms, decline in overall well-being. It adds to stress, just a lot of unnecessary stressors. Yeah, it's not enough to have to deal with an unusual diagnosis that most people haven't heard of and to understand the impact that it's already had uh, on one's body, uh, but to feel like the system is conspiring uh, against you at the same time is, is a big, big challenge. Absolutely. <clears throat> and then over one third of participants face denial of coverage for their treatments. So again, a uh, very frustrating, serious barrier to managing IgG4 RD effectively. And denial of coverage leaves patients without access, to, again, to the necessary medications and potentially worsening their health, uh, as well as, like I said before, adding an uh, enormous amount of stress. And, you know, I do feel that sometimes practitioners are reluctant even to undertake the idea of trying a new medication because of the uh, burden and the hurdles that they're going to have to encounter in trying to overcome uh, to get a new therapy for their patient. So all of these things are, are uh, challenges that the foundation is is working toward toward rising to. Yes. <clears throat> and then I we wanted to explore enrollment in clinical trials because 
we were interested to see if the enrollment in a clinical trial would reduce some of these barriers. However, due to the low number of participants, we couldn't fully assess this. As you can see, 94% of uh, survey participants were not are not enrolled in a clinical trial. So in my opinion, increasing research and trial participation is crucial. Not only does it give patients access to treatment outside of insurance constraints, but also to dive into the research and to raise more awareness, to develop new therapies and, and improve understanding. And part of the issue here is uh, there, there are just not enough trials going on. Um, at the moment, there are two phase three clinical trials. One of them has completed enrollment. The other is still uh, very actively uh, enrolling. But in order to be in trials, patients have to have access to trials. And uh, we certainly hope to see that grow. It's very well established that patients who are actually in clinical trials tend to get even better care or better care uh, than they do than they than they otherwise would. And Catherine, I think your own husband, I hope, uh, has also uh, experienced that. Yes. And uh, subjects in clinical trials really, I think, also derive immense satisfaction from the idea that they are contributing uh, to the body of scientific knowledge and making things better uh, for others. So this is important to do when the opportunities um, arise. And we'll be talking further about participation in clinical trials um, in the new year. Excellent. Then we dove a little bit into the experience and the, the patient experiencing accessing IgG4 RD care. As you can see, no one found it very easy or easy. And, you know, accessing healthcare even for something minor, it, it's not always easy, but I would hope that there would be a little bit more in that easy category. Um, unfortunately, 66% of respondents reported challenges in accessing care from ranging from difficult to very difficult. And again, reflects significant barriers that are, the community is facing when seeking appropriate care. Next slide, thank you. And then the challenges, um, and accessing care, the this was just astonishing to me. Um, the high numbers it doesn't it it's hard to pick which one. Obviously, you could see seventy percent finding a specialist, but just everything is almost at fifty percent or above fifty percent. But the two main challenges are finding a specialist knowledgeable about IgG four RD, and then navigating those barriers we're talking about. Even when a specialist is found, there's still significant barriers that follow. And we can all work together on some of these, particularly the finding a specialist one. Um, if you have found an excellent specialist, doesn't need to be a rheumatologist or a gastroenterologist, and, and a very interested, uh, motivated uh, general practitioner would be fine and wonderful to include uh, in our physician network. We're happy to help recruit them. All you need to do is uh, pass along uh, name and contact, and we'll, we will reach out to them. Excellent. Um, and then the most needed resources to overcome barriers. So we're aware of this within the foundation there that our community needs resources. And, you know, I'm very thankful that Dr. Stone has founded this foundation so that we can work on helping you all access these resources. So increasing um, the priorities that were, the top patient priorities were, again, increasing specialists, reducing wait times. That's something I hear all the time is just how long it takes to get to the right person. And when you're dealing with a, a disease that you pretty much don't know much about, you're not sure what's happening within your body, that's, again, adding stress that that individual doesn't need. So better care coordination and patient education are also very essential. Thank you, next slide. Just to quickly uh, recap some of the key takeaways that we took away from this survey um, was advocating for more knowledgeable specialists. And Dr. Stone has noted that we are working on that. That's one of our main focuses within the foundation. You may not know, but we have a physician network um, that you can access through the IgG Forward website and it has over a hundred specialists in around the world that are knowledgeable within 
with it IGD-4RD. So please, if you haven't looked at that, take a look at that. And we will continue to advocate for that. Um, insurance, you know, we're trying to provide the education, to provide the research, to help push for better insurance coverage, to reduce these barriers that you all are facing. It's not easy. It's it's an issue that everybody faces, but we hear you, we see you, and we're going to do what we can there. Um, improve care coordination and patient education. A big mission of ours is patient education so that you all can go armed with information to these doctors, knowing what you need, uh, knowing what's going to be best for you, and then you know the clinical trials that we touched upon before. And it's important to thank everybody who participated yes. uh, in this survey. You put this together very quickly, Catherine, and uh, through our subscriber network, uh, really we're, we're able to uh, have access to some terrific data um, in very short order. So thank you uh, to all who, who participated. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> now we're going to deep dive into the jam, and I'm going to start that off by asking Dr. Stone, uh, why are you interested in coming to the jam? Thank you, Catherine. So uh, this question makes me think back to about 2010 when we had just become aware of IgG4-related disease and had been taking care of patients for a few years at MGH, and we were interested in organizing a worldwide investigators meeting. It wasn't possible to... Uh, hold a worldwide or a nationwide patient meeting because there just weren't enough patients who even realized that they have had the disease and there was no organization to put that together. But there were people writing about it from all over uh, the world and particularly from Japan. And we got an NIH grant to uh, organize the world's first international symposium. And this was really a foundational moment, I think, for, for uh, IgG4-related disease. People did come from all over the world, especially from uh, Japan. You'll note all of the uh, Asians in this uh, picture to Boston uh, in 2011. And this meeting really created friendships that persist to this day and have uh, persisted now through the fifth uh, international symposium. So the coming together um, of people is, is really what I am most excited about with regard to the jam. So I met Dr. Uh, Yasuharu Sato uh, at that very first meeting. We can go back and uh, here is Dr. Sato. And here we are almost 15 years later in Milan at the fifth international symposium. Here I am showing him the secret IgG4 related disease handshake. Uh, I'm so happy to see him again, and I'll show you all that at the meeting, uh, too, although I don't know that kind of behavior will be uh, condoned. Um, here is uh, me with uh, a, a group of Japanese investigators again in Milan, friendships that uh, began in 2011. We, we started a wonderful trend, uh, uh, tradition at that very first meeting here on the left, Everyone, all of the attendees signed the poster for the meeting, and we continued that uh, in uh, Milan at the Fifth International uh, Symposium. So over this time, we have done a lot for patients, I believe. We have recognized the disease. That's obviously important. We've talked about the nomenclature and agreed on what we call this disease and its different manifestations. We've developed management guidelines, classification criteria that are used in studies and clinical trials. We have been very fortunate through wonderful collaborations with basic scientists to achieve some important scientific breakthroughs in this disease, which really reflect on not only IgG4-related disease, but human immunology more broadly. These have been important. We've done clinical trials. Uh, we are almost at the point of having our first drug approved, and we've created uh, the IgG Forward Foundation. So we've done a lot for patients in this time, but the jam is a chance to do something with patients. Uh, we do things with patients every day in clinic, but not as a group. And uh, that is really the extraordinary opportunity that the jam presents. For me, 
as a physician and, in a, and a researcher to do something with patients as a group and for patients to do things with other patients. That's what I am most excited about with regard to the jam. And I look forward to signing this uh, beautiful poster. We'll sign this part in white and we'll have some uh, blue ink here to sign uh, the clouds. That is gonna be beautiful once it is all signed uh, with all of the attendees. What about you, Catherine? What are you excited about? Sorry, I was on mute. I could probably speak for the remainder of this fireside chat in regards to my excitement and what makes me so excited about the jam, but I'll try to keep it brief um, in interest of time. When my husband was diagnosed with IgG4 RD uh, for about four years ago, we knew almost nothing about the disease and let alone, we certainly had never met anyone. Um, and it was a, incredibly isolating for him. It brought more fear. It brought more stress on top of everything else he was dealing with. And then fast forward to less than a year ago, we attended um, a patient workshop where there were a small group of people living with IgG4 related disease. And for the first time, all of these people had met somebody in person living with the same disease that they're living with. And, you know, as a clinical social worker, I understand the power of this connection, of the power of community, the power of social connection, and what that can do for somebody and for a community. It's vital to feel that somebody understands what you're going through. So witnessing that in person and the impact of that connection, not just for my husband, but for the 10 other people that were there was just eye-opening. And I am so excited to be able to provide that to our community in a large setting, a beautiful setting with key opinion leaders, other experts, and to come together. And then to also piggyback, Dr. Stone, on what you said about Milan. Um, when I attended the symposium in Milan, I was sitting there almost every day thinking, how can we do this? for patients? How can we bring this type of event to our patients? You know, that's geared for physicians and physician education, but our patients need that level of education. So I'm so excited that we are bringing that type of setting, that type of event, the same key opinion, some of the same key opinion, opinion leaders that were there will be at the jam. So there's a lot to be excited about, but, you know, I, I tried to keep it brief, um, and those are my main points. And we are going to have a lot of key opinion leaders at the jam. There will be more than 20 uh, key opinion leaders, and in the for the remainder of our uh, fireside chat here, we will review some of those. So day number one, uh, which will start about midday on Saturday, uh, November 9th, uh, day number one, uh, or half day number one, is understanding our disease. And the jam is a mix of short lectures uh, and breakout sessions, which we will talk about, and specific question uh, and answer sessions and other uh, times uh, for, uh, for socializing. Uh, so Dr. Arazu Khosra Shahi, who was present at the very first uh, International Symposium on IgG4-Related Disease in 2011. We'll talk about the history of IgG4-Related Disease, asking the question, why in the world did it take so long to recognize it, and how can we raise awareness? IgG4-Related Disease has special characteristics as a disease. It is very slow-moving. It involves multiple different types of organs, and these special characteristics really explain a great deal about the disease. It's very important for patients to understand these. So this is why we've uh, asked Arazu to give this first talk. Then uh, Dr. Corey Perigino, who is a wonderful translational scientist at Massachusetts General Hospital, um, will be talking about the importance of B cells in this disease. The therapies that are being developed now for IgG4-related disease focus on B cells. And the road to understanding IgG4-related disease really runs through an understanding of B cells. And Corey is a wonderful teacher. He will do a great job explaining that um, to our audience. And then questions. Kat. Yes. 
please, please come with your questions. There will be many opportunities uh, to ask questions. You know, as this quote says, questions are the key to unlock deeper understanding and insight. And that is so true. The questions are going to be so important, not only for you all to have some of your questions answered, but to for the physicians, for some of these experts to hear what are your questions and how can we help? So we'll make sure that there is time after all of the talks for you know some questions from the audience. Um, our breakout sessions, which I'll explain more on the next slide. And then uh, there'll be networking opportunities throughout each day, as well as the pass the mic hour. So we understand that the community gets very frustrated sometimes not being able to find a specialist, not being able to ask the questions, not being able to ask all of the questions that you want, having to type the questions in uh, online rather than, be, rather than being able to uh, speak uh, to someone about it. For this, the jam is just what the doctor ordered, I guarantee you. And what about breakout sessions? Okay. Yes, we've been talking a lot about a breakout session and we, you know, people may have seen that on our agenda. So we just wanted to explain a little bit about what that is because some folks might not know. Within our jam, we're going to have larger talks where everybody will be involved. And then we are going to have small focus groups that you all can choose from. We'll go over the topics momentarily and that will give an opportunity for groups to come together in a smaller setting which will allow for more conversation on the focus topic, direct questions, being able to share experiences. So breakout sessions are just a really great way to come together in a smaller group and really focus on the topic at hand. And the way these will be designed is, we, we've asked those who are leading the breakout sessions, say a, a key opinion leader talking about lung disease, in IgG4 related disease. We've asked the breakout session leader to maybe have just a few slides to level set um, and uh, tee up the topic, but then the balance of these really is gonna be about questions. And these are so fun. I love going to these at medical meetings. Everyone really enjoys them. And it's another great chance to uh, ask questions and to learn specifically um, about some topics within IgG4 related disease. So we planned a lot of these breakout sessions and it, I really I think this emphasizes the diversity of the information that's going to be exchanged here. So these are the uh, these are in fours um, uh, and so the attendees will be able to choose uh, from one of these four sessions to go to. One can go back and forth. Uh, uh, the sessions will last uh, about an hour each, so it is possible to go from uh, one to the other. So we'll go through these quickly. Um, Catherine will talk in one of them about thriving with IgG4-related disease. Uh, Emma Culver uh, from Oxford University will talk about managing IgG4-related pancreatic and biliary disease. Pancreatic and biliary disease is a very important topic within IgG4-related disease, of course, so we're also offering that on the following day. So if you're not able to go to it on day one, you can always go to it uh, on the second day. We will talk a lot at the uh, JAM about how to navigate uh, our complicated medical and insurance systems, and we'll be joined for these discussions on both days by colleagues in the Alliance for Patient Access, uh, Ryan Crump and uh, Casey McPherson. And then we will talk about uh, IgG4 related disease and the lung. Uh, Dr. Jason Springer from uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, trained at the Mayo Clinic. I've never met Jason in person, but I am really looking forward uh, to meeting him in person at the JAM. He is a wonderful um, pulmonologist, and he'll be uh, addressing lung issues. Then we have a second uh, session, uh, and there are three offerings in this session, so attendees can choose from one of the three. Uh, Bart Qualish uh, and Paul Scheel and Kevin Walton will be leading each of these, and we'll talk about these uh, briefly in succession here. So Dr. Qualish, you will know uh, Bart from the fireside chat that we did in July, 
um, ask the experts questions. Uh, Bart is both a neurologist and an ophthalmologist. He is a neuro-ophthalmologist. So uh, he deals specifically with IgG4-related disease involving the eye uh, and the base of the brain and the uh, meninges. He talked to some degree about all of those on the fireside uh, chat. He's a wonderful clinician. I'm so delighted that he can join us in Tyson's Corner. Paul Scheel, I was so delighted that Paul can uh, join us. Paul is a wonderful physician. He trained uh, a couple of years ahead of me at Johns Hopkins in internal medicine. He became a nephrologist. He became the head of nephrology at Johns Hopkins. And several years ago, he moved to Washington University in St. Louis, one of the premier uh, medical institutions in the country where he has a very high role in the administration there and continues his uh, active practice. Paul will be talking about a special clinical interest of his, retroperitoneal fibrosis, which can involve impact the kidneys. And um, so it's going to be terrific to have an expert nephrologist's uh, input on this issue, and I'm delighted that he can join us. Eating well for patients with IgG4-related disease. I was so pleased to make the association recently of Kevin Walton, um, who is a dietitian at Massachusetts General Hospital. And um, most of Kevin's work is on the inpatient service where he helps take care of uh, patients who have been hospitalized with major pancreatic issues. He's recently uh, begun an outpatient practice as well, and it's going to be tremendous to get some uh, real expertise on nutrition at the JAM. We have a short video with uh, Kevin coming up on our website um, in the next week or two, uh, so uh, you can look out for that. And then this will conclude the first uh, day of lectures and breakout sessions, and we will relax a bit um, with a cocktail hour and dinner. Uh, we have arranged for a uh, string quartet um, to play uh, during the cocktail hour and dinner. This, again, reflects back to our very first international symposium on IgG related disease where we had a, a string quartet who was very well received and very much looking forward to that. This will be a great opportunity for networking, to meet people you've never met before, to talk with uh, key opinion leaders um, in the field, a very important aspect of the jam. Then we'll move to day two, um, which is entitled Cornerstones of IgG4 related disease management for patients and physicians. And Catherine, you have recruited Amy Manning to do a very special thing. Yes, I, the first part I, of have. I have, and I'm very excited and to be able to offer this to our community. We're gonna start off the day on Sunday with yoga for everybody. And Amy wanted to make sure that we emphasized everybody there because she, wants everybody to know that, you know, even if you don't know what yoga is, yoga is not about getting on a mat and doing all these poses that look like you're putting your body in a pretzel. Yoga is really about finding that grounding, finding, you know, learning how to breathe. So she's going to make it an experience for everybody. So we're really hoping that you all um, sign up for this event. And no pressure, but I will be there doing it too. <laughs> And we do have some very excellent IgG forward yoga mats yes. uh, for attendees that you can take home. Then we'll move on um, to uh, the lecture portion of uh, the morning after breakfast, of course. And uh, Guy Katz is a wonderful clinician. He has been on our uh, fireside chats before talking about the pancreas. He's going to be talking about making a correct IgG4 related disease diagnosis. I know you will find that very interesting. Then Molly Carruthers, um, who is way out in Western Canada uh, in Vancouver and has a very busy IgG4 related disease practice, will share her knowledge uh, about how do, we un how do we understand the extent of the disease and how do we monitor for relapse. 
Then I will talk about avoiding the side effects of treatment. We are fortunate to have therapies for IgG4-related disease that work, but they do come potentially with a downside, with another shoe that may fall if we are not careful. So I'm going to talk about ways to use steroids, ways to use B-cell depletion and other therapies, and proper vaccine use, and how to choreograph uh, all of that. Then we move into this, the second day of uh, breakout sessions. And again, there are two sessions, session one and session two, four sessions uh, to uh, kick off, four, four choices to kick off with. Catherine will have a special session related to uh, caregivers, which she's done such a wonderful job uh, doing that in the context of the foundation and the caregivers. Uh, conversations that she's had and will be leading again in October. This will be, and this is an important time to emphasize that not only patients are welcome at the jam, not only clinicians are welcome at the jam, but caregivers also and family members and friends are also welcome at the jam. And all of these groups are eligible for the jam scholarship program that we may talk about at the end. Uh, rounding out the breakout sessions um, for the first part of day two, uh, we have a wonderful nephrologist, again, from the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, uh, Saif Alanizi, who will be talking about IgG4-related disease and the kidney. And then, again, a chance to uh, visit the uh, navigation of medical and insurance systems if you missed it on day number one or need to go back. Uh, to uh, hear it again on day number two with Ryan Crump and Casey McPherson. And then we uh, also have another gastroenterology colleague, a pancreatologist, uh, Dr. Yasmin Hernandez Barco, who will be talking about managing pancreatic and biliary tract disease. Short break while people switch rooms, and uh, then we have another session on retroperitoneal fibrosis, Dr. Tanaz Kermani. Uh, from UCLA. She'll talk about and address your questions related to retroperitoneal fibrosis and anything else. Um, and then Amy Manning, um, our yoga instructor, um, will be doing a breakout session on coping with stress and anxiety and uh, physical pain associated with IgG4-related disease. Uh, Guy Katz will then uh, tackle in another room some of the less common manifestations of IgG4-related disease, so not the pancreas, not the major salivary glands, not the eye, not the lung, not the kidney. There are lots of other organs that can be involved, and Guy uh, will address these and also be prepared to uh, tackle any other questions that you may raise. And then finally, we're so delighted to be uh, joined for the final uh, breakout session uh, by Dr. Emmanuel De La Torre uh, from Milan, the organizer of the Fifth International Symposium. And Emmanuel will talk about strategies for disease activity monitoring and anything else you want to talk about. All that is before lunch. Uh, and then we have lunch and, uh, again, an opportunity for networking. And then we move into the afternoon, and I'll pass it to you, Kat. Yes, again, I am so thankful that uh, Martha Otterbeck, who is a licensed independent, independent clinical social worker and has a practice in Massachusetts, will be joining us. Uh, Martha spent many of her years working in a large hospital as a social worker, as a clinical social worker, and now runs a private practice and has many patients who have dealt with disease, have dealt with you know, managing disease. Um, and she also runs support groups around uh, managing a disease. So I am delighted to have her because this is a very important conversation that is near and dear to my heart. And, um, you know, mental health is just as important as our physical health. So thank you, Martha, for joining us. Wonderful. It's going to be fabulous. And then we move on to another question and answer session. Pass me the mic. We will be passing the microphone around the room. If you haven't had a chance to get all of your questions answered, this will be the opportunity. Uh, we'll have a panel of uh, key opinion leaders uh, who will also have uh, mics, 
And uh, I think at this time, the, 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 the questions will be coming in, to in a Torah. People will be very comfortable um, talking in front of each other. And uh, this should be uh, a, a terrific session. And then finally, Catherine, you and I will conclude um, with Hope is Here. Um, I will be talking about uh, updates related to uh, clinical trials. We'll be talking about some of the uh, new initiatives of uh, the foundation um, as we wrap up. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing all of you uh, in Tyson's Corner. If you have additional questions, please let us know. I think we do have some questions uh, now um, that have been uh, submitted. Catherine, do you want to take take one or two of those? Yes, I do. And also, prior before I jump into the questions, I just want to say that we will have built-in breaks um, within our schedule for, you know, I know these days might feel long for some individuals living with a disease. I know that my husband gets tired after a day like this. So please know that there will be breaks built in as well as lunch and what have you. But also, if you need to take a break and step out from one of these sessions, please feel free to do so and you know connect with somebody within the group to find out what you missed. So I just wanted to make to clarify that point. Um, I did have a question in regard to the scholarship, Dr. Stone. When is that over? What do, what do uh, the patient the person's asking, what do we do in terms of the scholarship? Oh, okay. Yes, so uh, this is great news here. The scholarship, we're so proud of the scholarship program that the foundation is offering with the goal to remove barriers uh, to attendance. So it's uh, possible to apply for a scholarship. We're just about ready to award the first 10 uh, scholarships, and we have decided that there doesn't need to be a deadline for this. The scholarships really are limited only by the resources that the foundation can commit to this. So um, uh, we had published a deadline of September 9th, but we're delighted to abolish that uh, and uh, indicate that uh, you can apply for a scholarship all the way up to November 9th, uh, if you wish. We certainly encourage you to uh, apply early. Uh, resources are uh, not infinite. Uh, but we are delighted to help as many people get to the jam uh, as possible. And uh, those of you who have uh, applied will be notified uh, very soon. And then we anticipate notification uh, on a rolling basis. So there is no deadline uh, for applying for scholarships. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, could, and then I have a question about when the early registration ends. The early bird yeah, prizes. September, September 9th. Uh, so next week, uh, so the, the early bird registration uh, does end uh, then, uh, but registration, of course, goes uh, all the way up to November 9th. Even if you show up on November 10th, we'd be, uh, be happy to have you. Excellent. And we touched upon this already, um, but there was a question in regard to if caregivers, friends, family can attend. And that is a yes with a big exclamation point. Please bring along your your family and friends caregivers uh there as a caregiver i know how important we are on this journey and how important the information is for us to also receive um so please yes uh, you you do also have to register that person and that person is also eligible to like dr stone said apply for the scholarship we also had some queries about um whether we're going to be live streaming uh the jam and I should probably address that. We are, are not presently planning to live stream the jam. It's really so important to experience much of this in person. We are gonna be recording some of it, uh, some of the content for uh, repurposing uh, in other settings on our website and resources, uh, et cetera, but presently no, no plans to, to live stream. So please make every effort to, um, to be there in person and avail yourself of the scholarship program um, if that will help. We also uh, do have aspirations for doing the jam in other places uh, geographically uh, abroad. Uh, we're an international advocacy group, so uh, would love to uh, plan a jam uh, in Europe uh, next year and in Asia 
uh, the year after that. So more to come. And uh, also on the drawing board are regional events uh, in, in, in other places in, in North America. Were there any other questions, Kat? That there are none on my end. Do you okay. have any on yours? No, I think we're good. We wanted to have a short uh, fireside chat session today to just uh, give people uh, a sense of what the jam is going to be like since we've never done this as a community uh, before. If you have additional questions, you'll be uh, offered the opportunity to uh, submit them online uh, right after uh, signing off of the fireside chat. So we'd be happy to receive those. Also, through our online community or website, please reach out to us. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. It's been a pleasure. Yes, and thank you so much. Looking forward to October, uh, the next uh, caregivers conversation. Looking forward to it as well. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all in person at the jam and can't wait to shake your hands and give you a high five, what have you. Um, we're very excited. And I'll show you the IgG4 related disease secret handshake. <laughs> Excellent. Take care. Bye-bye.